I got an in and out situation going straight for the field. Number three hotel Victor, Roger. Runway one hundred clear to land. Bonanza three hotel Victor, just verify this is real world. Real world, in and out. Bonanza three hotel Victor, Roger. Wind two two zero at seven. Uh, going in the in the water over here. Roger, wind up the field two two zero six. Information on sail current. Attention all aircraft. Continue holding over uh, current area. We have a uh, situation on the uh, airfield. All aircraft stand by. Three hotel Victor, Roger, and uh, we got rescue on the way for you. You've just heard audio from a Bonanza pilot who landed safely after an engine failure in about a foot of moving water in the Rio Hondo Wash near the San Gabriel Valley Airport in El Monte, California. And our thanks to Live ATC for that audio. Hello again and welcome back to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips to help keep you safe when you fly. I'm Max Truscott. Today we're drilling deep down into aircraft electrical systems and how to deal with some common failures. By the way, if you have thought about maybe someday buying a Cirrus SR-20, SR-22, or SF-50 Vision Jet, or you would like flight training in any of these, there are many things I can help you with, so please call me today, 650-967-2500, for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Last week in episode 112, we talked about buzzing and low-altitude flying. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. This week in the news, an aviation pioneer is entering the ring to produce an electric aircraft. And a charter company is buying electric aircraft. And a Cessna pilot was just fined after he had a crash. All this and more, and the news starts now. From Wired.com, it's been three years since Andre Borschberg and Bertrand Picard completed an around-the-world journey in Solar Impulse 2, the sun-powered plane that could stay aloft for days at a time. That aircraft was remarkable but impractical. It had the wingspan of a Boeing 747 and maxed out at 90 miles per hour, and the cockpit was so cramped that the pilots, who alternated legs on the journey, used a toilet built into the seat. Now Andre Borschberg has started a new company called H-55 and created a new aircraft to flip that equation around. H-55's first plane has room for two and can stay aloft for about 90 minutes. The Bristol Energic is a modified version of an aircraft made by the Czech Republic BRM Aero, and where Solar Impulse was meant as an over-the-top demonstration of what electric technology can do, the Energic is a training plane designed to help people learn to fly in the first place. The new plane is all electric and represents Borschberg's latest effort to divert aviation from fossil fuels. He co-founded H-55 in his native Switzerland with two Solar Impulse colleagues using battery and propulsion technology licensed from the solar plane effort. The Energic is powered by a pair of battery packs that add up to 50 kilowatt hours, which is a bit less than you'd get in a Chevy Volt electric vehicle, which can be fully charged in about an hour. It can climb 900 feet per minute and cruise at 125 miles an hour, about the same as an engine-powered version of the plane. Otherwise, its spec sheet looks standard. Single propeller, steerable nose wheel, a baggage compartment behind the seats, and so on. Compared with the grandeur of the solar impulse circumnavigation, this effort can feel small, but Borschberg wants to make practical aircraft. And the realities of batteries, whose energy density is minuscule compared to that of jet fuel, mean starting with something small. As the technology improves, Borschberg hopes to sign deals with more manufacturers to build its system into their planes, moving up to four-seat aircraft into bigger aircraft from there. He's not a hardliner on electric and also is investigating a hybrid propulsion system, maybe with hydrogen power. The Swiss Aviator sees another upside to moving into the trainer market, getting new pilots hooked on the upsides of flying electric from the start. H-55 hasn't released the price of the Bristol Electric, but says it will cost just $7 to give the batteries an hour's worth of juice. I should mention that I saw the Solar Impulse three years ago when it landed here at Moffett Field in Silicon Valley, and I also invited Andre Borschberg to speak to our local aero club of Northern California, so it was a pleasure meeting him and his son when they were here in Silicon Valley, and we wish him well on this electric aircraft venture. From AOPA.org, Flight Design, maker of the best-selling CTLS series of light sport aircraft, has mounted a Siemens motor on the new F-2 to create an electric edition for certification. The F-2E made its public flight debut last month in Germany. The June 5th debut at the airport near Strasbourg, Germany, all a maiden flight on May 29th that was pronounced a complete success by the company. Tom Pekini, president of Flight Design USA, said market entry of Flight Design's new electric aircraft is still about a year and a half away, slated to follow certification of the new Rotax-powered F-4 and F-2 models announced in April. 
Pagini said the certified aircraft being developed will add to Flight Design's popular line of flight sport aircraft, not replace them. The CT Series LSA models remain the most popular in the United States, according to data compiled by Dan Johnson, president of the Light Aircraft Manufacturers Association. Pagini said the CT Supersport line is now available to U.S. customers, offering a lower-cost alternative to the CTLS series with simplified avionics and a price around $135,000 for typical equipment compared to the $170,000 cost of a CTLS model. The F-2 with Rotax power is expected to begin deliveries in October, following approval as a light sport aircraft. The F-2E, powered by a Siemens motor, will be the last of the new models certified since there is currently no pathway for light sport aircraft to be approved with electric propulsion. The F-2E will be certified, and since it will have two seats and the same airframe as the F-4, which is a four-seater, there will be lots of room for batteries. Also from AOPA.org, a charter sharing company is eyeing electric jets. A new company working to develop shared charter flights as a more convenient alternative to airline travel has committed to buying 50 aircraft from an innovator striving to put electric propulsion airplanes in the sky. Personal Airline Exchange, creator of a platform to link passengers and Part 135 charter operators for the first scalable solution for on-demand travel, said it placed an order for 50 electric commuter aircraft from Ampere, a Los Angeles company, on a mission to be the world's most trusted developer of practical and compelling electric aircraft. Personal Airline Exchange, or PAX, P-A-X, is in the fundraising stage, according to its website. It said Ampere's EEL electric aircraft will empower PAX to move more quickly toward its goal of offering travelers convenient transport to smaller airports closer to their destinations than airlines at costs comparable to driving. PAX intends to initially pilot its service with Ampere's aircraft in Southern California before scaling nationwide. PAX CEO Mike Azzarello said in a June 18th news release issued by both organizations. According to the announcement, Ampere's hybrid aircraft will help PAX service thousands of airports of all sizes with industry-leading operating costs. PAX said its platform creates shared flights and makes them available on a per-seat basis using behavioral economics and artificial intelligence. PAX added that it intends to reserve up to the first 1,000 Ampere tailwind electric jets when they become available. The new designed aircraft will leverage proven propulsion technology from Ampere's retrofit aircraft in order to enable a step change in aircraft performance, passenger comfort, and operating economics. From planeandpilotmag.com, after a fatal crash, the NTSB and FAA are sparring over skydiving regulations. The deadliest accident in years brings focus to NTSB recommendations a decade ago and what the FAA has done about them. The Beach King Air that crashed last week has begun to generate some back and forth between the NTSB and the FAA about the FAA's oversight of this segment. The crash, which occurred on the perimeter of the airport grounds at Dillingham and Oahu, Hawaii, killed 11, including the pilot, and five other employees of the skydiving operation Oahu Parachute Center. In 2016, the same airplane was involved in a mishap when the entire right side of its horizontal stabilizer came off in flight when it was at altitude. One of the skydivers captured the drama as all the parachutists bailed out when the plane went to a spin. The departed horizontal tailpiece can be seen in the video falling from the plane as well. Remarkably, the pilot of the plane was able to recover from the spin and land the plane safely. No one was injured in the event, and the plane was repaired and returned to service. The NTSB blamed pilot error and incorrect loading as being likely causes of the loss of control and structural failure. This week's tragic crash brought into focus recommendations the NTSB made a decade ago after another skydiving crash, which it says the FAA has not followed up on. The board asked that the FAA require greater oversight of maintenance and operations for commercial skydiving companies. In response, the FAA was adamant that it had improved oversight in both areas. The NTSB continues to investigate the Oahu crash in an attempt to determine what caused it. From AOPA.org, the FAA has assigned a joint FAA and industry committee to study ways to improve the DPE or designated pilot examiner system and report back with recommendations within a year. Of course, these are the people that give you your check rides. Reforming the DPE system has been a top priority for AOPA's advocacy efforts to end bottlenecks in the airman certification process. The review project assigned by the FAA to its Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee, or ARAC, on June 19th, quote, could go a long way to make much-needed, long-lasting improvements, said David Ord, AOPA Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs and the ARAC Vice Chair. 
The study, essentially consisting of a review of all regulations and procedures related to DPEs, will be carried out on a designated pilot examiner reforms working group. The panel must make its recommendations no later than 12 months after its first meeting. In August 2018, AOPA reported on a briefing the FAA gave the flight training industry on policies that could be overhauled to end delays that applicants face while trying to schedule practical tests. Many of the delays were caused by constraints on DPEs, such as geographical boundaries of their operating authority or a limit on the number of practical tests that they can give in one day. In October 2018, the FAA, responding to congressional action, issued a policy notice stating that DPEs were no longer limited to administering practical tests within designated geographical areas. The agency also gave DPEs expanded availability to work with applicants by abolishing the two-check ride-a-day limit and replacing it with a three-flight test-a-day maximum without additional approval. The FAA's new tasking also responds to congressional action through a provision of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2019. The working group will, quote, provide advice and recommendations to the ARAC on the most effective ways to identify areas of needed reform with respect to regulatory and policy changes necessary to ensure an adequate number of DPEs are deployed and available. The FAA said it wants a wide range of stakeholders to act as technical experts with an interest in assigning task of reviewing the DPE system. AOPA encourages members to apply to participate by June 22. And there's a link to where you can apply, and we'll include that in our show notes. And yes, there have been all kinds of issues with the DPE system, and that's certainly one of the major issues at the local flight school that I teach, uh, where we continue to talk about how to deal with that. From iPadPilotNews.com, how to use visual track log reviews and alternate airport planning in ForeFlight 11.5. ForeFlight's Rapid Fire Update Streak continued this week with yet another big release, delivering several new features that continue to push the app's capabilities. These include a new visual track log debrief tool, alternate airport advisor, runway selector, expanded European chart coverage, and FLARM traffic support for pilots flying in the UK with a Sky Echo 2 portable ADSB receiver. Track logging has become a primary focus in ForeFlight over the past few years, providing pilots with a wealth of important post-flight information that can be used for a variety of purposes. At the most basic level, track logging is great for generating automatic logbook entries and shareable maps showing your flight path across the ground. These basic track log and review features have been available for a little while now in the app while flying with a GPS source. The latest update takes the feature one step further and allows you to review granular detail from the flight using a new interactive graph. To access this, tap any of the track logs from the More section of the app, including logs captured prior to updating to the latest version of the software. The top half of the screen shows the traditional aeronautical map, and the bottom displays a profile view of flight stats. Press the play button at the lower left, and you can replay the flight at 20x speed, or use the slider to manually scroll through the flight. It's also important to always have an alternate airport in mind when flying outside the vicinity of your departure airport, and it's a legal requirement for IFR pilots when the destination weather is poor. To help with this decision-making, ForeFlight added a new alternate airport advisor feature to the flight section of the app. After tapping the alternate airport field, a new pop-up window will appear showing a list of alternate airport suggestions and a map showing their location. ForeFlight uses a number of criteria to narrow the list of suggested alternatives, including distance and fuel range considerations, whether the airport is closed by NOTAM, the presence of available instrument approaches, and forecast weather conditions. Additionally, ForeFlight will prioritize any airport that you've previously used as an alternate on flights with the same destination. And here's information about the runway selector. It says pilots flying larger aircraft with sophisticated avionics systems make it a habit to enter both the departure and destination runways into the system to assist with performance and navigation planning. ForeFlight now allows you to do this as well, providing similar benefits. After entering your route before takeoff, tap the airport ID bubble in the route editor and tap the select runway button. This displays a listing of all the runways, including a best wind indicator for the runway with the highest headwind component. And pilots flying in the UK can now take advantage of the Sky Echo 2 portable ADS-B receiver's capability and receive FLARM traffic data right in ForeFlight. And also from iPadPilotNews.com, the Garmin GTN Trainer, which is an app you can get for an iPad, is updated with new navigation and weather features. You're probably familiar with the GTN series, which has replaced the Garmin 43530. This is a new touchscreen version of that system, and it's easy to learn in a matter of minutes. But to help pilots better understand the system, Garmin released a GTN training app for iPad several years ago. 
lets you interact with either the GTN 650 or 750 using the iPad's touchscreen interface. The latest update adds a series of new features to match recent updates to the GTN avionics, providing an opportunity for pilots to learn the new features before climbing into the airplane. Vertical navigation to assist in descent planning and energy management, pilots can take advantage of VNAV profiles through the en route and terminal phases of flight. These altitudes will show in a new altitude column on the flight plan screen, and the TOD top of descent and BOD bottom of descent values are also calculated and displayed on the moving map. The long track offset feature has long been one of my favorites in any uh, GPS system, and you'll now find that feature in the GTN 650-750 as well. They say the feature is great for those times when ATC says cross 35 miles southwest of the Falmouth VOR at 6,000 feet. By the way, I use it all the time to set up my descent so that I arrive 1,000 feet above the runway, three miles away from the airport. So that's the long track offset feature. The system allows you to tap a waypoint on the flight plan, select the along track button, enter the distance offset either before or after the waypoint, and it will be entered as a new waypoint in the flight plan. You can then enter the assigned crossing altitude and use the GTN's VNAV feature to coordinate the descent. And the trainer's also been updated to simulate the new FISB ADSB weather products. Now, if you're pairing your GTN 650 or 750 with a compatible ADSB and product, you can now access the latest FISB weather products on the moving map alongside the flight plan information and dedicated weather pages on the GTN 650 750. These new weather products include lightning, cloud tops, turbulence, icing, both current and forecasted, graphical air mats, and center weather advisories. The next red no coverage overlay was also updated to be semi transparent, allowing you to view map features under the display. And by the way, the no coverage overlay. That's those portions of the country, many of them out here out west, where we do not have NEXRAD radar coverage. And so these are basically grayed out segments where you won't see any rain because there's no coverage of those areas by the National Weather Service radar. And finally, in the news from New Zealand, this comes from stuff.co.nz. Pilot who ignored passengers' warning has been fined for a crash. A commercial pilot who failed to de-ice the wings of a light aircraft which crashed at Queenstown Airport has been fined $2,600. Dionic Chatkavili, 34, had been made aware of the ice and frost on the wings of the Cessna 177 by his passengers before takeoff on August 15, 2017. He brushed some off with his hand and the rest, he said, would blow off naturally, according to the court summary of facts. The engine failed on takeoff and crashed moments later, coming down on grass to the side of the runway. The plane's three passengers sustained minor injuries, cuts, bruises, and sprains. One was partially ejected, and the plane suffered significant damage. CAA counsel Matthew Jenkins said the passengers' concerns about the ice was an aggravating factor, as was the seriousness of the crash. Quote, the fact that there were no fatalities was more a matter of luck than good practice, he said. Defense counsel Tim McKenzie said despite 1,500 hours of flying experience, Chatkavili was relatively inexperienced in flying Cessnas. Chatkavili admitted that the ice and frost affecting airflow over the surface of the wing could have contributed to the severity of the crash. Defense counsel Tim McKenzie said it was a case of low culpability in terms of dangerous flying offenses, one act of failing to clear ice and frost by a well-intentioned young pilot who did not have much experience in flying such aircraft. He accepts it came down harder than it might have otherwise. Chatkavili is an Airbus A320 rated pilot in Europe, he had resat 21 examinations in New Zealand and was applying for a job in the industry when he was charged. McKenzie said this was a huge mitigating factor. Jack Gavilli had dedicated money and time to his career, but would now carry a dangerous flying conviction with him for the rest of his life. The judge regarded the offense at the modest end of dangerous. He said this was a significant mistake by you. Your conduct was somewhat cavalier and not of the standard one would expect of a commercial pilot with passengers on board. It was the pilot's responsibility to ensure the aircraft could perform as well as possible, whatever the circumstances, he said. Quote, this has been a very sad day for you, a person who has invested so much of his life, finances, and emotional energy into carving a career such as this, cannot be anything other than sad that such an obstacle as this has been encountered, the judge told him. The court recognized that professional people make mistakes, but people had to be held accountable, he said. Jack Cavilli had paid $1,000 for the principal victim to go on a course to address the psychological impact of the crash with regards to future flying. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get on to our main topic of aircraft electrical systems and some common failures. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast.
And I heard a few of my quick updates. I'm just back from a five-day trip to Chicago, which was great fun. Combined a number of different things together. This was all at the suggestion of Arthur Gunn, who is, I believe, uh, president of the Chicago Executive Airport uh, Pilots Association. He's also the treasurer of uh, COPA, the Sierra Sonar Pilots Association. And he suggested that I should not only teach at the uh, CPPP over the weekend for Cirrus Pilots, but come in a couple of days early and give a presentation to the Chicago Executive Pilots Association and then fly with him for a day and a half, which we did. So on Wednesday night, I gave my uh, night flying safety, what's your CFI didn't teach you, presentation to a group of about 65 people there. It was fun meeting people. Uh, for example, Bob, who works for Southwest, came up to me and said that he's an Airplane Geeks uh, podcast listener. Not sure if he listens to this show, but <laughs> maybe we'll find out. There was a gentleman in the audience who was being congratulated by everyone because he just passed his IFR check ride. And you might think, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal was his check ride had been postponed three times because of snow and six times because of thunderstorms. <laughs> so I guess the, the tenth try is the charm. But apparently the weather has been really, really bad uh, over this past spring in Chicago. I kept hearing stories of a lot of thunderstorms. And sure enough, when I was there, it was uh, cloudy uh, every day. And we did have thunderstorms uh, at least two or three of the days uh, that I was out there. Uh, good time there. So then after flying uh, with Arthur for a day and a half, I went over to the CPPP where I flew with some people who'd come in to uh, learn more about Cirrus. Now, the fun part was on the way back to the airport, I was trying to hitch a ride and I randomly met up with a, a CFI who had attended. I hadn't met him during the the show and he was originally from Bosnia and uh, here's what he had to say. Max, it was it's strange having you in my car. I was listening to your podcast on the way here. <laughs> Is that what I said? Yeah, go ahead, say your name. Aideen Hedjic. And where do you live? Des Moines, Iowa. Cool. So special thanks to Aideen and his wife, Selma, for giving me a lift to the O'Hare Airport so I could uh, fly back home here. Now, while I was in Chicago, I got an email from someone who said, hey, have you heard about this crash? <laughs> it's not the kind of crash we normally expect. But uh, here's the story. Truck crashes into Palo Alto Airport hangar, damages planes, sends driver to hospital. So this happened on the uh, first day that I flew out to Chicago. And there were about uh, 12 pictures here. And actually, I'll just give you a couple of notes here. It says an out of control utility truck plowed into a hangar at the Palo Alto airport on Wednesday evening, damaging three to five planes and sending the driver who was believed to be a city of Palo Alto employee to the hospital. The vehicle was going full speed around 7 PM. According to a witness, I heard this crazy loud sound of a car going full speed, which is really unusual sound out on the field. Well, uh, this went plowing through the side of the hangar and damaged uh, several airplanes that were inside and there were 12 pictures online and as i started paging through them while i was sitting in chicago i said oh hey look at that there's uh, the nose of uh, my seaplane uh, which is parked right next to the hangar and it looks like it missed the plane by about three feet now i haven't flown the plane in uh, a number of years uh, probably uh, four or five years it's out of annual so anybody who's looking for a used lake amphibian uh, let me know because that uh, long past due to, uh, to to move that on to the next owner and let's see what else here. I read about uh, a possible landing fee at Oakland Airport. Apparently, uh, they're proposing a $47 landing fee for all landings at Oakland. So that's going to certainly curtail some of the uh, instrument training with circle of lands that I've done at that airport in the past. I don't have any details, but I'll certainly share that uh, when that occurs. And also, I want to mention a flight that I had to Blue Canyon about uh, two weeks ago. I had a gentleman who was visiting from another country who's uh, got a U.S. conversion license, and he wanted to do some instrument work. And after we got up in the plane, he said, hey, I want to also go to a mountain airport. Well, we hadn't done any planning on the ground, but he said he wanted to go to a Blue Canyon Airport. So we spent the entire probably 45 minutes that we were en route there in a Cirrus uh, SR-22 Turbo, making all kinds of calculations to figure out, hey, how is this going to work? And, uh, you know, what's the best uh, approach to do it? So Certainly, I think uh, it was a good best practice to have spent that much time figuring everything out. Would like to have done it on the ground, but we were able to do, do all of that in the air, including calling uh, flight service to find out if there were any notums for the airport. The airport, by the way, which is uh, just off of Interstate 80, is pretty high up. It's got a field elevation of 5,283 feet. It's relatively short for an airport uh, that high, 3,300 feet long by 50 feet wide. And it's got a rather interesting location. It's located right on the top of a canyon. 
So for one approach, which is the one we flew, you're basically flying at the side of a mountain. Uh, and then as you uh, c just come over the top of the mountain, you fly over Interstate 80 at pretty low altitude and then drop down on the uh, the runway. Now, what made it challenging is that in that direction, the uh, runway slopes downhill. However, we would have a headwind from that direction. We would like to have landed uphill, which would have been the other way, but we had a tailwind coming from that direction. So we did a lot of calculations to figure out which was worse, landing downhill or landing uh, with a tailwind. Turned out that the tailwind pretty much swamped out to everything else from a uh, performance standpoint. So we ended up landing downhill, though, with a headwind, and we did pretty well. Uh, we put it down shortly after the numbers and were off at the intersection about halfway down the uh, airport. So that says we probably only used about 16, 1,700 feet of uh, runway. Not bad for a, a Cirrus SR-22. And here's an interesting story came in from Trevor. He's a listener who said that it's possible to get free written exams if you're going for a check ride for uh, aviation. And here's how. Hey, Max, this is Trevor Smith with the Desert Pilot Podcast. Just wanted to share some consumer advice that you can take your written exams for free. I know I wasn't aware of it, and I think a lot of your listeners might not be either. But the U.S. government is offering free written exams if you can get onto military installations. So I'm a veteran, but I don't have access to uh, military installations, but I do work for the government, so that allows me to get on. Um, there's a list, and I'll forward that as well to you so you can send on, of the installations that offer FAA exams. And if there's one close by, it's definitely worth your time. Um, I took my instrument written, my CFII, and my instrument ground instructor um, all for free. So that saved me $450. So definitely I think it's worth the drive or any way if you can get to the installation. I called them in advance. You have to plan it out a little more than maybe some other testing facilities you might be used to, but um, just call them in advance, tell them your situation, and see if you can get on the base. And if you can get on the base, then you should be able to take the exam. Thanks so much, Trevor. And I'll include in the show notes the link that Trevor sent where you can find out more about free aircraft exams. Now, here's an interesting story that my friend John Williams told me. John is a radio control pilot, but he also has his pilot certificate. He spends a lot of time in Alaska, and he still has friends up there. And he told me about a gentleman who had an accident landing his mall, and I thought you'd be interested in that. I went online to uh, find the story, and of course, they don't tell the story that John told me. But here's what it says from RadioKanai.net. It says the pilot and sole occupant of a plane that crashed Tuesday into Mackey Lake in Soldatna, survived with mental injuries, according to CES, that's uh, Central Emergency Services. Nearby Good Samaritan rode his boat out to the down plane to assist the pilot. The initial call to CES was that the plane had overturned upon landing in Mackey Lake. Upon arrival by CES crews, the pilot was able to get out of the plane with the assistance of local residents as they responded by kayak and were able to get him to shore to our ambulance crews. And here apparently is the rest of the story, according to John, and I have no way to verify this, so take this with a grain of salt, but it certainly makes a good story. Apparently, this pilot, every spring, brings his floats to uh, an airport and lake combination, delivers the floats to the runway. He flies his aircraft into the runway, attaches the floats, and then can fly on floats all summer. Well, apparently, he did deliver the floats to the airport, but when he flew in, he forgot that they weren't attached, and he landed on the lake. Oops. So apparently, he landed on the lake while the floats were still sitting right next to him over at the runway. Interesting story. And speaking of stories, I had something interesting happen as I was driving home from the airport just before I left for Chicago. I was uh, on the Highway 101, which is probably about five lanes on my side, so figure 10 lanes total, and I was about one or two lanes from the, uh, the far right as I was going to be exiting uh, fairly soon, and suddenly I heard just a huge bang. I had no idea what it was initially, but it turns out the truck that was just slightly ahead of me and to the left had a tire blow right there on the highway. I had never seen that actually happen and had no idea how loud it was when a tire explodes. But uh, there was instantly smoke. You could smell burning rubber. There were flying bits from the tire that were hitting my car. And so as you can imagine, I just want to figure out how to get away from that truck as quickly as possible. So I slowed down. I knew he was going to be trying to get to the shoulder. So I kept uh, moving to the right, put on my flasher so that cars behind me would realize, hey, there's something up here. And that's what we're doing is slowing up because of this guy. And it made me think about what do we do when we prepare for flying? You know, what are some of the things that we just 
kind of plan for ahead of time. You know, in this particular case, you know, with that kind of incident, I just kind of knew instinctively, yep, got to figure out how to get as far away from this truck as quickly as possible. What do you do if the engine goes bang on takeoff? For example, I always have my clients do a pre-takeoff briefing in which we talk about exactly what we're going to do if something happens uh, during our initial climb. So, for example, I have told them if the engine quits below 500 feet, I'll be taking the controls and I want you to shut off the fuel. So if I hear that same bang while I'm climbing out, I'm already pre-programmed to push forward on the yoke because you're not going to have that much time, probably five, six seconds to get changed from a a climb pitch attitude to a best glide attitude. That's a huge difference in terms of aircraft pitch. But I make sure that as part of the takeoff briefing, uh, we talk about uh, exactly what's going to happen at every stage. So, for example, we'll say that if anything goes wrong on the runway, power to idle, break, break, break. If anything goes wrong below 500 feet, we're going to land more or less straight ahead above 500 feet. It's an automatic pull of a parachute on the aircraft. And above either 1,000 or 1,500 feet, we'll troubleshoot and consider other options. Now, I've also uh, kind of taken to letting people know that if we do have a problem uh, below 500 feet, I will immediately take the controls and I want them to be shutting down the fuel. And I verify that they uh, know how to do that. Good thing I found someone recently uh, who didn't know how to do that. Now, what I haven't talked about as much is what I'm thinking about throughout that first 500 feet of climb. And if I'm on my game, what I'm usually thinking is for about the first 100 feet above the runway, I'm thinking, okay, a quick left turn could get me onto the golf course, maybe for the next 100 feet, a 20 degree right turn, and I could land on a narrow levee in the marshland. And then above 200 feet, well, I'm going to land mostly straight ahead in the marsh, but then I'm going to have to make an over-under decision. And I'll have to decide whether to go under or over the power lines that are straight ahead of me, and also the lines that run perpendicular to my flight path, which are along my right side. Once I'm at about 400 feet, I know I'm going to be able to get over the power lines. And now I know that I'm going to aim for a narrow levee that runs along the shoreline just slightly ahead and to my right. So you might want to think in advance exactly what are you going to do as you take off uh, from your home airport? Have you already figured out where all the safe spots are to try and put the airplane down at each altitude as you climb out? And my special thanks to Derek Thomas, who sent me an email to let me know that I hadn't acknowledged something important. About a month ago, I started uh, offering a option for people to donate to the show through PayPal, and I had not seen any donations come through. And Derek said, hey, did you see my donation come through a couple weeks ago? And I thought, gee, no. And what I found is I had not set it up completely. So I went in and uh, finished the setup and found, hey, there's about half a dozen folks who've already donated via PayPal. PayPal actually takes a slightly lower percentage uh, than uh, Patreon, so it's a great option. So I want to thank uh, Sean Gordon of uh, SVK Software, Derek Thomas, Mark Tans of uh, Luxembourg, Alex Looney, Todd Boylan, John Jolly, who's got a $20 a month recurring uh, donation, and Daniel Downey for his recurring donation. And let me also mention briefly our Patreon site. If you're enjoying our show and find some value in it, well, hey, there's some extra value that we can offer you. For example, our $4 a month supporters get copies of our scripts for the news shows, and the $8 a month supporters get that, plus a link to all the stories we didn't cover in the news because of time constraints. This week, we've got eight stories that didn't make it into the news. Now, thanks to the new Patreon supporters who joined us in the last couple of weeks. They include Thomas Dean Weeble, who I had met just a week ago at AOPA. Trevor Smith, who just sent us our uh, recording on the free exams, Kyle Lemon, Jennifer Gulahardu, and Romeo Hotel. Now, you may recognize Romeo Hotel as a co-host for the Opposing Bases podcast. I want to thank him very much for his support. Now, in a moment, we're going to be talking about electrical systems and electrical system failures right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let's talk about electrical systems and failures. Last week in Chicago, I led an interesting discussion for about an hour about what a pilot might do if he or she lost their PFD or primary flight display while flying IFR in the clouds. Now this was for the Chicago Executive Pilots Association and it was before I gave my night uh, flying presentation. And it was a scenario that was prepared by the IMC Club. The IMC Club is a program of EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association. And they have local IMC club chapters that offer monthly meetings in which pilots can network and share knowledge and experiences. And I'll include a link to them in the show notes in case you're interested in starting your own local IMC club chapter. But back to the failed PFD. If you fly round gauge airplanes, let me explain that the PFD is the primary flight display. 
It's the computer screen directly in front of the pilot, and it displays the six flight instruments, airspeed, attitude indicator, altimeter, and so on. And it displays a lot of other important information. And if you fly a Garmin G1000 or Cirrus Perspective, in this scenario, your instant reaction may have been, well, this is a simple problem. I'll just push the display backup button. And that indeed would be the correct answer because it takes the PFD information and displays it on the MFD or multifunction display, which is a computer screen on the co-pilot side of the airplane. But this scenario, which apparently actually happened to a pilot who submitted the information about it to the IMC club, happened in an older Avidyne Cirrus SR-22. These were the glass panel systems shipped in Cirrus starting in 2003 through mid-2008 for the SR-22 and until the end of 2008 in the SR-20. And there is no display backup button in these aircraft. So when the PFD fails in these aircraft, you then have to use the three round gauge backup instruments, which are for airspeed, attitude indicator, and altimeter. And you do lose the flight information that you would normally have gotten from the turn coordinator, the DG, or the directional gyro, or HSI, and the vertical speed indicator. So we talked for an hour, and pilots talked about a variety of different points about how they might deal with this situation. Some talked about whether to return to the departure airport, where the weather, by the way, was worse, or whether to continue to the destination airport, where weather was better. And we talked about different ways to troubleshoot the system, whether we might be able to reboot it while in flight. And we talked about the autopilot and the capabilities we would lose because of the failed PFD, and some of the steps that we could take to mitigate that. One pilot even commented, would a pilot know all of this stuff? <laughs> That's kind of a tough question to answer, but frankly, a well-trained Cirrus pilot or flight instructor would know most, if not all, the points that were brought up uh, as training an aircraft system is pretty important in these aircraft. Now, at the very end of the discussion, I pointed out that not a single person in this group of over 60 people during the hour that we discussed the scenario even mentioned checklist. <laughs> now, that's a major fail, as there is a failed PFD checklist for this aircraft, and I'm very familiar with it, as it's one of the few checklists in a series that says at the very top, for aircraft built before a certain serial number, follow this procedure, and for aircraft built after that serial number, follow a different procedure. So the first point I want to make about dealing with electrical system failures is that at some point, you should refer to your checklist. Because many failure procedures can be found in checklist, and often it will include steps that you don't even remember or didn't even know. I encounter this constantly during my training for the Vision Jet type rating. As for most of the cast messages or crew alerting messages, there is a checklist to be followed for each cast message. And after you do the first couple of memory items for a particular procedure, you then need to go to the checklist to continue working through a problem. So let's start by talking about the basics of electrical systems. The first point is that they vary widely among aircraft. For example, some aircraft, like the original Piper Cub, don't even have an electrical system. So I'm going to talk in general terms today, and some or maybe all of the things we talk about may not apply to your particular airplane. So I strongly suggest that you pull out the POH for the airplane that you fly most often, go to Section 7, which is a system section, and find the description for the electrical system in your aircraft and read through it. I always tell my clients that their goal as a pilot is mastery of the airplane. And you haven't mastered your airplane if you're unfamiliar with one or more of the systems in the aircraft. Let's start by talking about voltage and current. Now, there's a very common analogy that's often used to help understand electricity, and you may have heard it before. That's to compare it to a system of plumbing pipes. And in that case, you can think of voltage as being equivalent to the water pressure you might find in a pipe. And current is being equivalent to the rate of flow of water from the pipe. And you can think of resistance as being like the pipe size. And of course, you probably know that voltage is measured in volts using a voltmeter, and current is measured in amps or ampers using an ammeter, not an amp meter. Remember, it's an ammeter, which is spelled with two M's and no P. And the most basic electrical system is just a battery, nothing else. For example, in your ELT or emergency locator transmitter, there's a built-in battery that powers the system once it's been activated by a crash. But that battery will eventually run down because there's nothing to recharge it. So in addition to a battery, most electrical systems have an alternator, which is used to charge the battery, though it only works when the engine is running above some minimum RPM. It's mounted in the engine compartment, and it's connected to the engine by a belt or sometimes driven by gears that turn the alternator whenever the engine is turning. Now, some airplanes have a generator instead of an alternator, and you'll most likely find a generator in older, kind of 1950s vintage aircraft, such as Cessna 170, before alternators became more common. 
You'll also find them in modern-day turboprops and light jets, and some aircraft like the Cirrus Vision Jet have both a generator and an alternator. Now, here are some of the differences between generators and alternators. A generator has built-in magnets, and when it's turned by an engine, it produces electricity. Conversely, you can also use a generator as a motor. Just apply a voltage to the generator, and it will start to spin like a motor. So many turboprops and light jets use a generator because it can be used in two ways. When you first start the aircraft, you apply voltage to the generator, and it acts as a starter motor to start the engine or jet. Then, once the engine is running, the generator produces electricity to recharge the aircraft's batteries. Now, the disadvantage of a generator is that at lower RPMs, it doesn't produce enough electricity to charge a battery. Hence, general aviation manufacturers started using alternators instead of generators sometimes in the 1950s or early 1960s. And most modern light GA aircraft today use alternators instead of generators. The advantage of alternators over generators is that they weigh less and they can produce electricity even at RPMs as low as perhaps 900 or 1,000 RPM. The disadvantage, though, is that alternators don't have magnets built into them. Instead, they require an external source of electricity, like a battery, to power their internal electromagnet before they can then begin producing electricity. So if there's a dead battery in your aircraft and you're able to get the engine started by hand propping the plane, you still won't be able to recharge the battery in your plane because the dead battery has no electric current available to power the alternator. By the way, this power needed by the alternator is called the field current, and it typically requires at least several amps of current. Now, here's a key point about this. If you're on the ground and the engine isn't running, and you want to turn on the electrical system so that you can do something such as update the GPS database or pre-flight the lights and flaps, just turn on the battery master switch. Don't turn on the alternator switch or switches. Because when you turn on the alternators, the field current starts to flow to the alternator, and now you're just further draining the battery. Because when the engine isn't on, the alternator can't generate any power. So it's a total waste of battery power to turn on the alternators if the engine isn't running. And just so you know, the alternator switch in the Cessna 172 is labeled the Alt Master, short for alternator. And it's the left half of the red rocker switches that you may think of as the master switch. The right half of the red master switch is the battery master switch. So just turn on the right half of the red master switch when you're on the ground doing your pre-flighting and checking the lights. In a Cirrus, the alternator switches are labeled Alt 1 and Alt 2. And again, don't turn them on if the engine isn't running as you'll just be running down the battery. By the way, there's one other really good reason in a Cirrus to not turn on the alternator switches on the ground when you turn on the battery and the engine isn't running. Let me quote from an SR20 POH. The hour meter, labeled Hobbs, begins recording when the Bat 1 switch is on and either Alt 1 or Alt 2 switch is on. So you got that? Not only are you wasting battery power if you turn on the alternator switches as part of your pre-flight, but in a Cirrus, you could get billed for Hobbs time while you're sitting on the ground pre-flighting the plane. Now, the electrical system in most modern GA aircraft is referred to as either a 24-volt system or a 28-volt system, and it doesn't matter which one you call it, as it's the same kind of system. These aircraft have a 24-volt battery to power the system, and they have an alternator that puts out about 28 volts to charge the battery. That's because to charge a battery, you need a charging source like an alternator that has a higher voltage than the voltage on the battery that you want to charge. Older aircraft built in the 1960s and earlier usually have 12-volt batteries, just like most cars have. And those aircraft have a 14-volt alternator. Now, higher voltages are useful for moving lots of electrical power over longer distances, which is why the electric utilities use very high voltage for their high-voltage transmission lines. Likewise, as manufacturers started putting more and more electrical equipment into airplanes, it made sense to switch from a 12-volt system to a 24-volt system. That's because with a 24-volt or 28-volt system, the current required to power any given item is half of it would be with a 12- or 14-volt system. And that means you can use smaller wires and smaller circuit breakers to protect each of the electrical components in the plane. Now, that's particularly important with high current items like an air conditioner, which might, say, draw 50 amps of power in a 14-volt plane, but only 25 amps of power in a 28-volt plane. What you may have already figured out is that when you're on the ground and you first turn on the battery master switch, your voltmeter will show around 24 volts. And if it's much less than, say, 23 volts, you might not have enough juice in the battery to get the airplane started. In cruise flight, when the aircraft is running and the alternator is turned on, you'll probably see right around 28 volts on your voltmeter. But if in flight the voltmeter reads closer to 24 volts, then either you've turned off your alternator 
or it's tripped offline and needs to be reset, or the alternator's had some type of hard failure and you'll need to have it fixed after you land. On the ground, after you've started the engine and turned on the alternator, you may notice that your voltmeter will vary between 24 and 28 volts depending upon your engine RPM. At low engine RPMs, say below 8 or 900 RPM, the alternator won't be putting out much of any power, so you'll just be seeing the battery voltage on the voltmeter, which will be around 24 volts. As you increase the engine RPM, the alternator will start to produce more power, and you'll see 25 volts, then 26 volts, and finally up to 28 volts. And certainly by the time you reach 1700 or 1800 RPM while you're doing your engine run-up, most alternators will be putting out enough electricity that you'll see a reading of right around 28 volts on your voltmeter. Now, there is one exception that I know. In older Avidyne Cirrus aircraft, here's what an SR22 POH says about alternator 2. Alt 2 light will eliminate steady, which would be a failure, and Alt 2 will not come online until 1700 to 2200 RPM. So you might not see the Alt 2 light go off until after takeoff in one of these aircraft. Now there's another important component in the system that just doesn't get talked about very much, and it's inserted in line between the alternator and the battery. It's called the voltage regulator, or in some aircraft it's called the alternator control unit. It provides a couple of functions. The main function is that it regulates or varies the output of the alternator to match the current requirements of the aircraft at any particular point. I'm sure you can imagine that sometimes you have very few electrical items turned on in the airplane, and at those times, especially if the battery is fully charged, the alternator doesn't have to produce much electricity. Yet at other times, you may have all the lights on, the air conditioner on, and then activate the flaps, which temporarily requires a lot of current. And at these times, when you have a high electrical load, the alternator needs to put out much, much more power. Now, a typical aircraft alternator probably puts out eh, a little under 32 volts. That's what goes into the voltage regulator, which then regulates the voltage down to 28 volts, which is the voltage that's fed to the battery and then to the rest of the electrical system. The voltage regulator works hard to keep its output as close to 28 volts as possible, regardless of whether the electrical system is drawing just a few amps or drawing lots of current because you have everything turned on at the same time. The voltage regulator also has an overvoltage protection circuit, and it continually monitors the voltage coming out of the alternator. And if it senses that the alternator output voltage is too high, and it's unable to regulate that voltage down to a reasonable level, it calls timeout. It just shuts down the alternator, which should then immediately end any overvoltage condition. Now, when this occurs, the voltage in your aircraft will drop from 28 volts down to 24 volts over perhaps oh, one to three minutes. Then over time, the battery voltage will drop below 24 volts, and the battery will eventually be drained if you don't take steps to prevent that. So initially, you have a high voltage, which might be a transient that only lasted for a fraction of a second, which causes the voltage regulator to turn off the alternator, which then results in a low voltage. And when this occurs, you should get some kind of warning light. I've noticed in pre-1986 Cessnas that sometimes this light is labeled high voltage, in other models it's labeled low voltage. Also, some of these red low or high voltage lights are located near the bottom of the instrument panel near the pilot's knee where they are well outside the normal view of a pilot. In these older aircraft, if you don't see the red warning light telling you that the alternator has gone offline, then the battery will just continue to drain until eventually all the electrical items in the aircraft stop working. So if you don't notice the red low voltage light after your alternator dies, your first warning that you have a problem may be when your radio stopped working. By the time that happens, the battery voltage may be too low to power the field current needed by the alternator in order to produce electricity. So even if you properly reset the alternator, it can't come back online and you'll soon be flying an airplane without electricity. On the other hand, if you notice the red light soon after it came on and you reset the alternator before the battery voltage got too low to power the alternator, the alternator will come back online and charge the battery. In later model Cessnas, those built after 1997, there are much better warning systems. In these aircraft, when the electrical system voltage drops below 24 volts, you'll see a low volts enunciator come on, and it's located at the top of the instrument panel, where it's much easier to see. And in G1000 equipped Cessna 172s, you'll also hear a chime that continues to drive you nuts until you silence it. So in these aircraft, it's almost impossible to not notice that you have a low volts error. Now let's talk about what to do if you're flying a Cessna 172 and you notice the electrical system voltage has dropped to 24 volts while you're in flight. Here's a checklist I found in section three, emergencies, 
from a Cessna 172R model POH. You may want to pull out the POH for the plane you fly most often and compare its low voltage checklist with the one I'm about to read. The title of the checklist is Low Volts Annunciator Comes On or Does Not Go Off at Higher RPM. Step one, master switch off. Now it's the alt master. So that's the left half of the red master switch we talked about earlier. And you're going to turn it off. Number two, alt field circuit breaker check in. Now that's the circuit breaker for the field current we talked about that's needed by an alternator in order to produce electricity. And if that circuit breaker popped, it will have taken the alternator offline immediately. So if it's popped, you need to push it back in. Number three, master switch alt and battery masters on. This tells us we need to turn on not only the left half of the red master switch, but also the right half if it's off, and that's the battery master. So essentially what we've done is we have turned off the alt master, checked the circuit breaker, and turned the alt master back on. And typically that's all that's required to bring the alternators back online. Step four, low volts enunciator, check that it's off, which it should be if that fixed the problem. Step five, M bus volts, that's the main bus volts, check 27.5 minimum. Number six, M battery amps, check that it's charging and that you have a plus indication. Now I've had at least a dozen electrical failures in older Cessna aircraft, and this procedure works the vast majority of the time, but it can't fix all failures like a broken wire or a broken alternator belt. If something like that happened, the low volts and unseer is gonna remain on and you'll need to proceed to the next portion of your checklist which in this case says, if low volts enunciator remains on, seven, master switch alt only off. So that's the left half of the red master switch. Eight, electrical load reduce immediately as follows. And then they list a whole bunch of switches to turn off. So avionic switch, pedo heat switch, beacon light switch, landing light switch, taxi light switch, nav light switch, strobe light switch, and cabin power 12 volt switch. All of these go off. And then there are a number of notes in the checklist before he gets to item nine, which says nine, land as soon as practical. Now, a typical question I often hear is if I can't get the alternator working again, how long will the battery last? And I'm here to tell you that the answer that you hear most of the time from people is wrong. And I'm telling you this from my perspective as a trained electrical engineer. Here's what you'll typically hear, which is wrong. Let's look at the rating of the battery, they'll say. Batteries are rated in amp hours, which is the number of amps they will provide for an hour. So far, so good. So for example, people will tell you, and I read this all the time, if you have a 10 amp hour battery, then you can get either 10 amps from that battery for an hour, or you can get one amp out of the battery for 10 hours. Well, like most things, the answer is more complicated than that. Now, it turns out that this common answer you hear is true if the only thing your electrical system is powering is a light. So yes, if you had a light that only drew one amp, 10 hours from now, you should probably still see some light coming from the lamp, in which case you did get the full 10 amp hours out of your battery. But you've probably noticed that most of the equipment in aircraft is a lot more sophisticated than a light. And while a light can still be useful at lower voltages, a transponder is not going to work at the same low voltage that will still produce some light from a landing light. Here's a simple description of how battery manufacturers specify their batteries. As you pull power from a battery, the voltage is going to gradually decrease over time. Now, there are a variety of different battery chemistries that are used, and how the voltage decreases over time varies a lot between these different types of batteries. For example, some batteries will show a continual steady decrease in battery voltage as they're depleted, while others will maintain a relatively high voltage for a long time before they drop suddenly in voltage as the battery becomes nearly depleted. So when a battery manufacturer has to specify whether the battery can hold 10 ampere hours or some other amount, they have to assume some minimum cutoff voltage, which would be the minimum voltage at which stuff connected to the battery will still work. But different things or different stuff that you might connect to a battery stops working at different voltages. So for example, as voltages drop, one of the first things to stop working will be your transponder. And that's because it transmits a strong pulse every few seconds, and that requires a lot of electricity for a fraction of a second. And as the battery voltage decreases, at some point its voltage will be too low to keep the transponder working. Now your comm radios will probably still continue to work at slightly lower voltages, so they may still continue to work for several minutes after your transponder stops working. And once your comm radios stop working, you'll still be able to get some light out of your cockpit lighting and your landing light if they're still turned on. 
Now, a battery manufacturer wants to make their battery sound as good as possible, so they're going to spec it at a relatively low cutoff voltage, which means that you may be able to pull the full 10 amp hours out of a battery for items such as lights that continue to work at low voltages, but you won't be able to get the full 10 amp hours of a battery for items like your transponder, which won't operate at lower voltages. Thus, I like to tell pilots to be conservative when they estimate how long their battery will last and that they'll only be able to get about 80% of the rated battery capacity. So in this example, assuming that you had a 10 amp hour battery, assume that you'll get about eight amp hours of power from it. But here's one other wrinkle. The faster a battery is drained, the fewer total amp hours you can pull from that battery. So let's assume you could pull one amp from a battery for 10 hours before it dies. If instead you put a 10 amp load on the battery, it will last for less than the theoretical one hour. Or if you put a 100 amp load on the battery, it will give you even fewer total amp hours than it will at the one or 10 amp rates that we just mentioned. So remember that, the faster you deplete a battery, the less total power you're gonna get out of it. And here's how you can put this knowledge to use when you have an alternator failure. Now the Cessna 172 POH I was reading doesn't specify how many amp hours the battery will hold but when I looked online, I found vendors selling 10 and 11 amp hour batteries for Skyhawks. And the Cirrus POH does specify that the battery in that aircraft is a 10 amp hour battery. So that's a nice round number. So let's use that for this example. So when the alternator fails, turn off all the essential equipment in your aircraft. Then see how many amps the electrical system is still drawing by looking at the ammeter. Let's say you have a 10 amp hour battery and you got the total current down to 10 amps. So that 10 amp hour battery divided by 10 amps gives you one hour. But as I mentioned before, some of the equipment in your plane will require a voltage that's higher than the minimum cutoff voltage the battery manufacturer used to specify their battery. So assume you'll just get 80% of the specified battery capacity. And instead of one hour, assume in this case, the battery will instead last for eight tenths of an hour or 48 minutes. And as you're turning things off in your airplane and watching the reading on the ammeter decrease, be creative and aggressive as possible to reduce the current to the lowest reading you can. Turn off as many switches as possible and then start pulling all the circuit breakers you reasonably can. Now in the extreme, if you wanted to preserve the maximum amount of battery power possible after an alternator failure, you can just turn off the battery master switch. Now you've stopped using all electricity and your battery will be in good shape when you get to your destination so that you can use it for things like lowering the flaps, calling the tower on the radio, or if it's night, using the comm radio to turn on the runway lights at your destination airport if it has pilot controlled lighting. And if you were getting flight following, well, you could tell them that you're shutting off the radios and you'll turn the master switch on every 10 or 15 minutes to give them a quick progress report. So we've talked about the most common electrical failure, which is the alternator stops producing power for some reason and you have a low voltage, perhaps 24 volts or less, and you're gonna to attempt to get the alternator back online. But you could also have a high voltage condition, though this is much more rare. Let's say, for example, the voltage regulator failed and it's now delivering the full 32 volts from the alternator to the battery and everything connected to the electrical system. Now the current on the ammeter will increase because whenever you increase the voltage to something, it starts drawing more current. Now the over voltage protection circuit that's part of the voltage regulator, that should take the alternator offline with a high voltage, but if for some reason it didn't, you'd want to follow the overvoltage checklist for your plane. From the same Cessna 172 checklist I referred to earlier, in Section 3 Emergencies, I found an item labeled High Volts and Unseater Comes On or M Battery Amps More Than 40 Amps. That checklist starts with 1. Master Switch Alt Only Off. Now that was the same as the first step for our low volts checklist, but in this case, We'll be turning the Altmaster off and leaving it off. Two, electrical load, reduce immediately as follow, and then it tells you to turn off lots of switches. Now it tells you to select COM1 and NAV1 for use because the next step is to turn off the avionics switch. And in this version of the 172, which is a G1000 equipped plane, turning off the avionics switch turns off COM2 and NAV2 and the audio panel. And when the audio panel is turned off or fails in this airplane, the pilot's headset is automatically connected to COM1. So you'll need to preset COM1 and NAV1 before you turn off the avionics switch. And the final step is land as soon as practical. And there's a note that you should make sure a successful landing is possible before extending flaps. They note that the flap motor is a large electrical load during operation. And I think the concern there is that if you were to be uh, nearly depleted on the battery and you put the flaps down, if you didn't have enough energy in the battery to get the flaps back up again, 
that could be a real problem in a go-around situation. Well, that's all the time we have for now. We've just scratched the surface of aircraft electrical systems. So if you have specific questions about them, send me your questions and we'll talk more about aircraft electrical systems in a future show. Coming up next, some listener feedback right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And here's an email from Charlie in California. This week's podcast was one of your best. Now, he's referring to episode 111, where I talked about uh, my uh, client, Chris, who died in an icing accident. He says, it's obvious how much pain you are in with the loss of your friend, and we are also saddened by this unnecessary tragedy. While your podcast couldn't help the dead, I really believe the depth of your analysis and the learning that came out of it may save lives down the road. Well, I certainly hope so, Charlie. Charlie says, I had quite a few aha moments when I listened, and even you reported some significant lessons you learned. Looking back, I think I was very lucky to survive my 20s, given the icing encounters I had in Skyhawks and Arrows, planes that had nothing for ice protection. Most of the people who listen to your podcast are amateurs, me included, who fly under 100 hours a year. And while we have some training, we have limited understanding of the subtleties that a professional pilot understands. Thus, while half solutions like TKS and the Cirrus, as opposed to the flight into known icing version, may be useful to a professional, it's a potential bomb for those of us who don't understand the subtleties. Thanks for shining a bright light on this. Thank you, Charlie. Here's a comment from uh, Neil Cosentino on uh, Twitter, and I think this was just a general comment. He said, I'm a 6,000-hour Air Force pilot, F-4s, ATP, CFII, and ME, 1,000 hours in the PA-31. Please consider the following. All pilots must review the accident, incident, and mechanical history of an aircraft make and model they will fly for the first time. Why? Less likely to repeat the same mistakes. Couldn't agree with you more. Anytime I get into a, a new aircraft type, I spend a lot of time on the NTSB website just trying to figure out what kind of accidents are more common for those uh, airplanes. Now, here is uh, feedback on episode 112, where we talked about low altitude flying and buzzing. Tim from Facebook says, dipping below 500 feet will get you a drone strike and it would be your fault. Would not like to see that headline. And Keith says that uh, he's involved in firefighting. He says, we fly low every flight. The systematic way we go about it in nearly a year of training with an instructor helps mitigate the risk, but we're not immune either. He says, a few rules the road. One, make at least one orbit before going low level. Two, usually more than one set of eyes are on the area, but not always. Three, we do flight idle descents to the target and get back away from things as quick as possible, flying low only for a few seconds. Three, smoke puts things closer than they appear. Five, constantly moving your eyes close, far, and laterally makes things stand out. Six, unlit towers may exist up to 199 feet. Seven, don't suck. And that was one of the comments from uh, an ag pilot in that show who said that uh, the problem is that people really suck at flying low. And Mike in Southern California says, just listen, Max, another excellent podcast. I would only add that we shouldn't use even current charts to determine where wires are, especially in areas subject to wind and therefore installation of large wind farms. Those wind turbines are going in so fast that the charting folks have no hope of being able to keep up with the changes. I've heard a few people over the last couple of years who are used to flying low and slow across the country who no longer do that. Wow. And I mentioned to Mike when I replied to him that there was something I forgot to put into Episode 112, talking about low-altitude flying, and that is the skinny gray research towers that the wind companies are putting up often are specifically 198 feet tall. And they do that because if they were 200 feet tall, they would have to light them and they would have to register them with the FAA and their competition would try and figure out where exactly they are putting these towers up. Uh, and so uh, you really have to watch out for those towers. We had a, an ag pilot in uh, the Delta probably about four or five years ago hit exactly one of those towers. He was down low uh, spraying and uh, this tower had just popped up for a wind turbine company and he was unaware of it and got killed in the crash. And here's an email from Fred in New York. He says, I don't know how you do it. One episode is just better than the next. I just got done with the low flying episode. What an important subject that really gets no treatment anywhere else. Good for you. I suspect you have a lot of new pilots as listeners who are hungry for more community and insight than they get in their flying lessons. If they were not aware of the dangerous activity of flying low and its dangers, they will be now. Thank you very much for that. You're also very brave. The label belongs to anyone willing to take up the sticky subject of carburetor heat. Great job directing people to their training and their manufacturer recommendations, as well as their own personal experiences. We sure could use a lot less quotes like some guy told me once. For every line on a checklist, there are a few volumes of data sitting on the manufacturer's shelf somewhere, 
which I hadn't really thought about, but that uh, certainly makes sense. And then Fred winds up. He says, congratulations. I'm heading over to Patreon tonight to add you to my list. Well, Fred, thank you so much for that. And we're going to wrap it up right here so I can get started on my holiday weekend. If you're interested in buying any model of Cirrus airplane or jet or interested in flight training in one, please contact me immediately as soon as you start thinking about it. In some cases, I can arrange a free demo flight for you. And I'm also happy to talk with you about the ins and outs of buying new versus you. So call me immediately when you start to think about this. I'm at 650-967-2500 or go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact at the top of the site. And you could also use that site to leave any listener questions or give us any feedback. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the world. And finally, I want to ask for your help. Please take a moment to show your aviation friends how they can get the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, just send them to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store to download our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast app for iOS and Android. Just go into the App Store like you would for any other app, search for Aviation News Talk, and download the app. And of course, those apps are free. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>